Thank you for being here. So glad to see everybody. Look at this nice old room. When was the last time we did that? Well, for a brown bag, it's been a while. We filled the room yesterday for our membership meeting, but uh, it's so good to see everybody here. We are, of course, thrilled to have Kurt Garner, who um, is uh, the, he's the Marshall County historian. Um, in addition to that, he's a preservationist, has a lot of great information for us, an anthology of uncommon Hoosier history. So I know we're all looking forward to that. A um, couple of things I want to mention before we get started. One of which is we would love to have you as a member if you are not already a member. <laughs> I forgot to turn the time off. And um, I want to introduce Anita Boltzmann, who has another little thing to tell you. Hi, um, I'm the new communications uh, manager, and we are planning a kind of a fun fundraiser for this summer in conjunction with the sidewalk sales. We'd like for you to, you know, do your spring cleaning and uh, maybe see if you have some fun vintage or uh, gently used furniture or items uh, that we could sell for the museum. So if you do, just bring them in. Um, we're accepting between now and mid-July when the sale is, and we're hoping for a really good turnout. We'd like to turn it into an annual event, and uh, the nicer the items we get, the better off we all are. So thank you very much. We hope you'll participate. No clothes, right? No, no clothes. No clothes. No clothes. Too hard. <laughs> it's, it's too hard to handle clothing. So we're not collecting that, but anything else that you've got, clean out the attic. So we've got a few items that we could sell to benefit the museum. So um, we've got one more person coming in, and then we'll get we'll let Kirk get started. Okay. Well, I did want to uh, make another announcement, and, and you guys are going to be like some of the first people to hear it. But on June 11th, which is a Saturday, uh, you're going to have a small rededication service at the courthouse. The courthouse will have been in use exactly 150 years to the day on June 11th. So I know that there's still some restoration work, you know, that's finishing up over there. But uh, there's going to be a small, uh, small service on the east steps. So um, I just wanted to bring that to your attention. June 11th at 11 o'clock. 11 11. 11, 11. Well, um, Sue, I appreciate the introduction, and um, you know, always enjoyable to, to be able to come and, and talk about uh, uh, different aspects of usually Marshall County history. And I was saying, I rarely ever get the opportunity to actually talk about what I do. And my son's here, Jack. And famously, uh, my children one time, uh, they were called upon to, to explain what it is their dad does. And they, they could not. Um, and that was just last year. No. <laughs> I'll, I'm going to talk a little bit about that, but mostly I'm, most of them are going to focus on, on the natural register. So um, if you were watching the slideshow that I had going before this, uh, I have hit, uh, well, just as of yesterday, I finished my 216th natural register nomination. Now, to put that into perspective, um, each nomination at the, at the very low end is about 20 pages. At the high end is approaching 100 pages. And the first one I did, I'll, I'll talk about, was in 1998. But that's, uh, in Indiana, the most anybody had done was about 40, if that gives you some idea. And the most anybody has done in the country is about 100 to 120. So I am just trying to run laps just to make sure that nobody can ever um, uh, break my record. <laughs> but anyway, um, yeah, so out of my travels, most of my work has been done, has been in Indiana. Out of my travels, um, I pulled, you know, out of the 216 nominations, most of those being done in, in Indiana, uh, I tried to pull the ones that I thought would be of, of kind of interest, you know, kind of the uncommon Hoosier history. I mean, we all hear about certain aspects of Hoosier history. 
I thought that if I focus on things that were a little out of the ordinary or buildings that were a little out of the ordinary, you guys might really enjoy that. So no, I'm not going to go through all 216. We uh, would be here forever. So uh, that house, actually, the, the one that, so I have these signs that I bring around and, and uh, put in people's yards. Uh, it's a little different than political signs. Um, <clears throat> you don't get the hate mail. But uh, <laughs> that's actually, I, I, you know, people will ask for these, and so I, I get them. But that's at the McDonald House. McDonald was intricately involved in the Wabash and Erie Canal. This is in Attica, Indiana. That house is actually, uh, was part of it, uh, Indiana Landmark's uh, 10 Most Endangered at one time, and it's been restored and turned into a, a B and B. So, 200 stories, uh, or and counting, uh, and three quarters of the counties in Indiana. So, out of all of Indiana, um, if you kind of wonder, those are just kind of based on years from the time I started uh, my own uh, business till today. Um, you can see how that's just expanded. And last year, and I'll, I'll show a graphic, last year I did more work in southern Indiana than I did in northern. So I'm really kind of just making my way all around the state. Um, that photo is in Michigan City. Uh, I did three large districts there, and then they had me come back and, and uh, design signs for them. So this is, this is based on 2021. So <clears throat> my National Register of Work typically is about half of what I do. So last year was about 53%. That's pretty typical. Um, my design work is, I mean, I went to school, I went to architecture school, really it's only about 10%. And I was telling my friend Matt back there, I said, I'm ready to give up the 10%, I think, because it's just not as much fun. Um, <laughs> then I, I do things like studies, uh, work with uh, our state byways, um, corridor management plans, things like that. That was 20%. And then I do um, a lot of grant writing and uh, grant uh, administration and tax credit work, and that's that 16%. So that's kind of last year. Um, and then uh, I kind of have a, a philosophy where I, I try to give back. So um, out of the 200 and some nominations, about 20 or 10% of those have been donated. So if there's an organization um, that just kind of strikes a chord with me, well, then I'll, I'll, I'll do that work for free. But uh, that's how last year, that's how my pro bono time was spent. So about 300 hours, and that's how it divided up. So um, that's about a month's worth of work or so, I don't know. But, uh, and then as, as, as I'm working more in Southern Indiana, I'm thinking, why am I driving and spending the night? I'm actually trying to work more um, in like a two, two hour uh, radius. So I kind of started looking at work in Michigan and Illinois. So I've got a few things that are, are kind of cooking in those areas, uh, particularly in Buchanan, Michigan. Oh, and I'm gonna, you're gonna hear me talk about some of this stuff. So why do people ask to have their property on the National Register? Why do towns and municipalities, counties, uh, pay me to come down and do an evaluation, put their properties on the National Register? Typically it's because of tax credits. So there's a 20% tax credit that comes along with preservation work if you're on the National Register. Certainly tourism development, I get paid by tourism offices to come into their counties and do an assessment of how they can um, best uh, position themselves with National Register historic properties. Um, and I mentioned grant programs, there's, there's different kinds of grant programs that are out there. And then something else you're gonna hear me mention is, so, the, the process for a National Register nomination is that it, it's reviewed at the state level and then it gets transferred once it's passed here, it gets transferred to the National Park Service and that's actually listed. Well, the National Park Service has something called a Multiple Properties Documentation Form and it's a whole lot of words and it's a whole lot of pages. But that what that does is it allows properties that are similar all across a state or depending on the context, um, to, to fall under that. So it's like an umbrella program for National Register properties, specific types of properties. And I'll mention, there's I've done about five of them 
uh, so far. So the, the very first one, so this, so that's young me uh, back in 1998, 99. And when I first, uh, graduated from architecture school and, and came back and started working for Brent Martin. Uh, one of the first projects out of the gate were the downtown facade restoration. So if you remember those back in the, the late 90s, uh, the Reese Theater being one, Treats for Her, when it was Treats for Her. So that got me really interested in looking at the history of these buildings. And out of that, uh, there was a group of us that met. Um, Bill Laramore was, was part of that group, Linda Rippey, um, myself, uh, and it was about six of us that met. And we decided to, to walk through this process with the National Register. So that's the very first one that I did. It was downtown Plymouth. It was listed in 1998. And I did it from the second floor of the Chamber of Commerce. So right there. That's where I first lived. And when my wife and I got married, we bought a house within, a, within about two months of that. And moved it from South Michigan. Now, how many remember the controversy surrounding Save Shady Rest, right? Okay. Well, <clears throat> I, I tend to get myself in trouble uh, politically often. So um, when the county came back and said, well, it's going to be millions of dollars to bring this building up to grade and all this kind of stuff. Um, and then their consultants said, it also wouldn't qualify for any grants because it wasn't historic. Well, I knew better. So um, I did this, you know, kind of behind the commissioner's backs and got the property listed, which actually ended up giving it over a half million dollars in grants. So when Bowen Center moved in, they undertook the restoration and, um, and, and it was because of, of getting it listed. So that was number two in 2000. Promise I'm not going to go through every single one. So then over the course of the next few years, uh, particularly through White Bogan Valley Preservation, our preservation organization, we listed a number of other properties. Some of them were done, uh, like the Hemingway Travel Lodge were done to get a grant application. Um, others were kind of the recipients of the grant application, like uh, Summit School. So um, that kind of, kind of concluded by about 2000 and seven or eight. <clears throat> so 2008, uh, August 1st, 2008, I walked out of my employer's office and, and uh, didn't know what I was actually going to do. Um, planned to just kind of work on my own until, you know, I always tell people, you know, until God shows me something different, this is what I'm going to do. So it'll be 14 years in August this year. Um, I had one project lined up. It was it was this little uh, National Register nomination um, up in Elkhart, the courting house. Courtings were, uh, what was it, Miles Lab? So they worked for Miles Labs. And, um, they hired an architect named Alden Daw uh, to come in and design their home. And uh, he was kind of famous because he was a, a student of Frank Lloyd Wright's. In this house, I brought my cheat sheet. This house is built in. 1937. So that was my first project out on my own in 2008. And she's cutting the mic. I'll just yell really loud. <laughs> um, by the end of 2008, um, a gentleman contacted me. me. His name was Jim Morrow. And he actually had roots in, in Baroque uh, here in Marshall County. And he had started an organization called Partners in Preservation. And Jim was a kind of a, an eccentric guy, and he um, his thing was to get properties listed on the National Register, mostly residential properties. And he contacted me, and he was had had started the organization a, a couple years before this, and he had said, "Kurt, I just can't. I don't understand. I put ads in the newspaper. I can't get people to to do this, or they don't do it right." And I'm like, "Well, it's kind of a." It's kind of a specialty, Jim. I don't know putting ads in the newspaper for people is going to do it. But anyway, Jim Morrow actually just passed away two months ago, just a few weeks shy of his 100th birthday, uh, but was a phenomenal, phenomenal benefactor uh, uh, to Indiana landmarks, actually to, to all around the state. But uh, he lived up in Northwest Indiana, and 
his passion was really for kind of the region. And so he was funding nominations there and then um, really kind of uh, leaned heavily into the rest of the state and started funding nominations. And then as he got older, uh, Indiana Landmarks took over his program. And that program lasted to about 2017. Actually, I just finished one that had been hanging out there for a long time. But technically, it went from about 2009 to 2017. And just me. I, you know, working with Partners in Preservation, did 70 uh, properties uh, through Jim's program. Um, I think that it was estimated he funded somewhere around 200 nominations himself. So great benefactor, uh, quite a legacy that he's got. And that included several, uh, he asked me, he's like, well, Kurt, he goes, do you have anything in Marshall County that you, you know, want to get listed? So we started with the uh, individual properties. Um, anything that was eligible, and, and obviously the owners would concur, uh, we got those listed. And then, um, and if you remember Wythogan, uh, in 2016, we did our bicentennial project where we listed the rest of the district. So all of the eligible districts and properties in Marshall County are listed with the exception of the um, And so in 2009, I was contacted by the Indiana Dunes uh, National Lakeshore then, National Park now, and they had a number of properties that had had not been, they were developing one of those multiple properties documents, but they were running into issues with their consultants, and so they asked if I would come in, finish that, and then list their Swedish properties. Um, they had several, so anyway, so uh, so I came in and, and, and cleaned up the, the nomination forms and then wrote the, the actual National Register nomination forms for the individual properties. And um, that resulted in, I think, five or six properties that they own, farmstead mostly, uh, to be listed. And then they said, hey, while you're at it, um, we've got several uh, pretty modern architecture kind of buildings that are part of our park property that we need to have listed as well. So that went into listing about three or four four or five other uh, properties. And let me tell you about this one. Um, that's Herb and Charlotte Reed. And Herb is an architect from Chicago, uh, designed that house, their house. They were the first to offer it. I don't know if you know how the National Lakeshore came to be, but there were basically buyback programs that the National Park System um, offered to people. And Herb was the first one to, to jump into that to kind of help create the the Indiana Dunes, and he was also uh, instrumental, um, met with President Kennedy in order to actually have that done. So he's part of the contingency that went to, uh, to Washington, D.C. Really fascinating couple. Their house is like a little mini museum. Um, and I'm, I'll speed it up now. So uh, then I got work in Rensselaer. There were people that were really interested in getting their post office listed on the National Register. They wanted to get a grant to restore the mural. How many know where's where's the one post office in, in Marshall County that has a mural? Over, over. Okay. Uh, if you haven't seen it, go in and see it. I think it's really fascinating. Um, so anyway, that led to that. Um, and then in 2009, Wythogan did the centennial observation of Chief Menominee. And so, uh, so that was one of my freebies. Um, and what a fascinating history for that came, that just brought to life. I mean, you know, we all take it for granted, but boy, if you really read how that came together, where it came from, and um, really pretty fascinating. First publicly funded monument to the Native American. Um, this was one of Jim's projects, Jim Morrow's projects that he asked me to, to look at. Uh, you've heard of the Standard Pullman District in Illinois, right, in Chicago. Well, did you know there was one in Indiana? This is in Hammond. It's kind of right on the border between Hammond and, and Gary. Uh, planned community, um, all residential. There, were, there was a, kind of a social hall, but uh, brought in to, to do this one, um, which is kind of interesting. Um, and then in, let's see, I should be using my cheat sheet. In uh, 1919, there was a strike where four workers were killed 
and 60 were wounded. Didn't know that, did you? Did anybody know that? Yes, no. Oh, Jim did. Mine. <clears throat> well, it's uncommon through your history. It's not <laughs> unknown. See, <laughs> uh, This was, uh, anybody ever been to Rowan, Indiana? Okay, all right. Um, I was hired to come in and do the whole town as a national register district, and that led to about five or six more that would follow, and uh, which is kind of an unusual situation, but um, that was interesting. First whole town district. And then, uh, did, did anybody know that Frank Lloyd Wright had a son named John Lloyd Wright, who was an architect? All right. Um, John, well, who knew, who knew that? What was he famous for? You know, he invented something. How many played with Lincoln Logs as a kid? He was the inventor of Lincoln Logs. But he also designed homes and he made his home after he got mad at his dad and he left working for, for his dad's company. He moved into Long Beach, built a house and started doing uh, several homes up in Long Beach before he moved to California. And so uh, this, this house is called the Pagoda House. Um, that was one of five that I did. He did a school, if anybody's seen the Long Beach School, the little school and the town hall, he did those as well. I listed the, the school as well. And then um, people ask, you know, well, have you lost any? Well, I have. I've lost three out of the 215, 16, whatever. Um, so anybody drive by the the old circus barns on 31 by Grissom, all right. So that was one of my listings. And the way the state got around to being able to demolish that is that they had to help fund the Circus Hall of Fame that's the other one, uh, that's by Peru. So, um, but that's one, the old Lakeview home, which is the White County uh, County home, uh, was demolished. And then of course, you know, the Burger Gym was one of those three. So here was a creepy one. All right, so I get, I get invited to, to go over to uh, DeKalb County to look at mausoleums. And I don't know, have, has everybody, anybody ever been inside an old one? Yeah, I hadn't either. People were shocked that I had never been inside one. I'm like, why would I? So uh, they've actually got four in DeKalb County. And this was one of those things where the state came back, the National Park Service came back and said, we don't care if you write nominations for these, but you have to do an all-inclusive document. So I had to go find all of these early community mausoleums um, throughout Indiana. And so I think I'm up to about 32, 33 or something like that that's part of the list. But I had to write a whole document about this. And um, uh, Cindy, uh, Cindy over at the library. Yes, yeah, Cindy Cloud, who gets my interlibrary you know, loan books for me or had. Um, I was asking for all these obscure books about death and cemeteries, and she's like, what on earth are you working on now? <laughs> well, that was, that was for the mausoleum, uh, mausoleums, and this actually led me to do my first project in Illinois, so just across the state line in Beecher, uh, she, the, a lady contacted me to, to do that one. They were kind of a marketing scheme. They were sold like, basically almost like condos for the dead. I mean, like, <laughs> the, the company would come in and once they made enough money, once they sold enough slots, then they would take their money and run. And they said, oh, these, these will, you know, they'll fund themselves in perpetuity. Well, they haven't. Um, and, and there were a few people that got really rich off of it. Uh, we was contacted to do the, the Studebaker. Uh, has anybody seen the, the renovation of the Studebaker building, the main building there? It's just really quite phenomenal. It forms that backdrop to the South Bend uh, baseball field. But I was asked to come in and do a nomination that kind of captured what was left of the Studebaker uh, complex and the depots because it, it kind of related to each other. And then that actually led to my first one in, in Michigan, which is the one that I'm working on now, the Clark, Clark Equipment in Buchanan, Michigan, uh, doing that complex. Uh, this is some of those weird ones. 
So uh, there's, there was a, a gentleman in, uh, in uh, uh, Rensselaer who just really had a love for modern architecture. And there was a, moder or a modernist architect that was working in Rensselaer, um, kind of spent his time between Rensselaer because that's where his family was from and uh, Chicago. And uh, Frank Fisher was, was really kind of a genius um, when it came to how to, to, to compose space and stuff. So this was another, the National Park Service said, we don't care if you list those buildings, but you have to have a document that ties everything together. So I had to do one of those multiple property documents on uh, modern architecture in Rensselaer, Indiana, um, which was limited to just Frank Fisher's work, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> but, Anyway, uh, so that was that was uh, kind of an interesting project, and then that led to um, I don't know if anybody's been to St. Mary of the Woods campus. Unbelievable campus in the middle of I'd say a cornfield, but you know Indiana, but just quite a phenomenal place. And at first they only were going to do the school buildings, so the school campus is kind of delineated from the sisters' campus. And they ended up, uh, there was a company that came in and was going to take one of their um, dorms. The sisters have dorms. Anyway, it was going to take one of the, the, the uh, nuns' homes and convert it into senior housing. And so they wanted that tax credit program in order to do that. So then they, uh, the sisters invited me back to do the whole campus. Talk about a preservation save here. Um, so, the folks uh, in Randolph County asked me to, to come down and, and um, <laughs> list this really wonderful little schoolhouse. I mean, it was just a gem, even when it was in the rough, right? Uh, <clears throat> you don't often see you know, these Gothic inspired uh, schools, but uh, they got, got it listed and they applied for a grant and that's the result. And quite honestly, that's why I do what I do. Is I like to see that history carried forward in a way that other generations can enjoy um, as well. They're using it as a little community hall sit in a really tiny, or just outside of a really tiny town in uh, Ringbow. And you guys, some of you guys probably saw the, the presentation I did on, on our home. Same kind of situation. Uh, I wanted to access tax credits in order to do the restoration on our home. So I got that listed as well. So, you know, the before and after kind of speaks for itself. This was, uh, so uh, in 2015, no, 14, 13, 14 and 15, um, the Lincoln Highway Association hired me to do their corridor management plan. Um, and I had worked with them in the past. And as part of that project, they wanted a, a, a multiple properties document done as well that can capture historic resources that are along the Lincoln Highway, not unlike the Heminger Travel Lodge here in Plymouth. And so uh, usually when you do that document, you also have to submit a nomination with that. And so in this situation, has anybody been past this? I had never even been to Benton, Indiana before, but Elkhart County, uh, the little log cabin tourist camp. There's a, a gentleman that's slow, slowly restoring all the little cabins. And um, I, just, I think it's a gem. It it's right on the, the old Lincoln Highway, the, the original part. Uh, 17, I, I was contacted uh, by the tourism office down in Ripley County. They wanted to get all of their important bridges listed. So they had uh, two covered bridges and this stone bridge um, that they wanted me to look at. And so um, did the two, two covered bridges and then the stone bridge actually dates from like 1905. I would anticipate being older, right? Reverse? No. Um, there was a a uh, bridge builder down in that area that was doing these incredible sonar bridges. This is the largest of those. Um, and if you see the photo in the bottom corner, that's them actually building the bridge, which I just thought was really fascinating. That's they got the horses with all the rigging and uh, there's no water. Well, they dammed it up. So they, water. <laughs> <laughs> they, they picked low tide. <laughs> But those 17 or those bridges led to 17 bridges that I've done so far. Uh, iron bridges. Um, this is Pyatt's Mill Bridge. It's the oldest iron bridge in the state. It spans 
the Little Pigeon River between uh, Spencer and Warwick counties down in southern Indiana. Um, it's just a phenomenal structure. It's the only structure of its kind in Indiana with the uh, those uh, arch trusses. And then the most photographed bridge in Indiana, I think probably arguably is the one in Dean Blossom because so many people live around county. So that's one of them. So realizing I'm getting a lot of these kind of projects, I had my nephew knows how to do, oh, now see, this is going to take extra, extra steps here. So I started to have, uh-oh, is not going to work? There we go. So I started providing drone footage on these, particularly on the bridges, um, because it kind of helps to tell the story. So when I do these nominations, I have to show why the bridge was important to the community that it was in, why, why it acted as kind of a crossroads. Um, and so I've started uh, doing these. Uh, Jeff Chamberlain's going to photograph a few for me in a couple of weeks. But, um, and the state has, the State Historic Preservation Office has, has responded really well. They really enjoy seeing these because they see how all the roads come together and the tributaries that come into the river. And so it offers a different kind of picture than what you can typically uh, do. So I started offering that as, as kind of part of what I provide. This is fantastic. I couldn't believe it. All right. So this was a fishing lodge that this guy built, uh, Mr. Campbell. Looks like Virginia. Well, <laughs> does Virginia look that nice? <laughs> So, um, built in 1863, this Mr. Campbell developed the state's first fish hatchery and a fishing lodge. And no kidding, you could drop your line right down through the porch floor. So, this is what he did was he uh, <coughs> dammed up a small creek, you know, kind of spring fed creek. And there's a pond to the kind of to the back of that. And then, um, there's like a waterfall that's actually under the house. It's really quite a fascinating little place. Um, and when I got the project with this, it put me right at, I had done work in half of Indiana's counties at that point. So I was pretty excited to get this. This is in uh, Washington County. Yes. Yes. Oops. Oh, oh, oh okay. Um, uh, anybody ever been to, been to Wolcottville in LaGrange County? Um, so this was uh, George Wolcott's house. He um, traveled from Connecticut and built this house, built a sawmill. And what was interesting about Wolcott is this is 1838. And there's actually, you can't hardly see it. You probably see it better in the photo of it where it's been redone. There's actually an Indian mound, kind of where that little pine tree is. So, and he knew that because he started digging there. So he <laughs> built his house to the back of it. Um, but Wolcott comes down through one of the signers of the Declaration of Independence. So I thought that was interesting. The other thing that I'd never known, I, you know, I I went to school at in Marion Springs, right? So at Andrews University. And so I was kind of northern Indiana, southern Michigan. There's a lot of these types of houses that are Greek Revival in style, um, but really good examples. And when I was doing this, I learned that there was something called the Western Reserve. And these are called Western Reserve Greek Revivals. And the Western Reserve was a piece of land that Connecticut got. I didn't know this. Who said, uh-huh? Uh-huh was a piece of land that Connecticut got that was this narrow strip that went all the way into Illinois. And so their people would, you know, their pioneer settlers would come across in that Western Reserve area and they would build houses that are very unique. It's like, it's uh, the Guthrie house down in Park County. Um, Mr. Guthrie was kind of like one of the, one of the men that, really helped establish the Indiana State Parks as we know them today. And while it might not look like it on the outside, the inside of that house, this is right down the road from uh, uh, Sugar, Sugar Creek. 
uh, Turkey Run State Park. Um, Guthrie became the manager at the inn at Turkey Run, and his whole basement level is like you're walking into the lodge at Turkey Run. So I assume that many of you have been there and, and know the type of architecture that I'm talking about. Fireplace, the old hickory furniture. Um, he essentially built a lodge inside of this house and uh, was really quite well known, um, kind of in the conservation circles during the 19. Uh, 20s and 30s. So I got 1968 up there because that was the first time I did a project where it's as old as I am. So <laughs> that became a landmark right there. Um, this is Dick Fletcher's house. So the Dick Fletcher that had Amish Acres. And Matt, you're the one to put me in touch with Mr. Fletcher, aren't you? Um, this was, it was a lot of fun for me. I mean, he's a great guy. But I don't very often get to list things that are almost uh, that re are representational of some other type of architecture. And so his, uh, his architect, which was a friend of his, um, Holderman, um, took the concept for Dick Fletcher's house, which I would have expected him to live in a barn or something, right? <laughs> uh, which I guess it kind of is. So his inspiration was the buggy sheds that the Amish have. And so those are uh, two kind of interposed uh, buggy shed forms for his own. And cemeteries. I get, I get hired to do a cemetery, and then all of a sudden I'm doing two or three. Um, so uh, the top one is South End City Cemetery. That was a project where I kind of took a nomination that was kind of half-baked and, and brought it to completion. And then uh, was hired to do um, Spring Vale, which is in Lafayette. And then I was hired to do another one in Lafayette after that. But um, yeah, uh, these are part of what they call the Rural Cemetery Movement, which was established as cemeteries as parks and not so much as just graveyards. So if you think about how they would be designed differently in terms of like the views, the vistas, and, and those kind of things. And I had to throw this photo in there because I thought it was just fascinating. So this, that grave marker is this. So this is a clan funeral. Um, and there's a, there's a lane that runs this way and that's the lane that they're, they're on. <laughs> Indiana, right? I love this. So, get hired to do a couple of projects in Seymour, Indiana. Who's from Seymour? And his house was one of uh, one of the homes in, in this district. And so, if you look at this is the house. That's what it looks like today. This is John. But you see the house in the background. That, that was probably just just for that fact alone. <laughs> I kept looking for little pink houses and I didn't see. <laughs> um, and then speaking of, you know, kind of these uncommon Hoosier history kind of pieces. Uh, did you know that the guy who was the founder of the Stetson Hat Company married an Indiana girl, moved her to Pennsylvania, and because he would come back to Orange County to visit her family, um, built them a brand new house. So this massive house and it's Looking a little rough here, it's been restored. Um, it was built by the Stetson of the Stetson Hat Company. Um, did you know that the Coke bottle originated in Indiana? Okay, so Chapman Root uh, built this fabulous, sprawling kind of thing on a hillside out on the south side of Terre Haute. And it is basically a ruins now, but they wanted to get it listed in, as a way to kind of entice uh, tax credit money coming into it. This, this what was an enclosed pool is just covered with mosaic tiles of all kinds. And then there was a palm, a palm house, a palm, palm room, where they had, it was like a massive conservatory with palm trees in it too. Obviously the palm trees aren't very fancy. Uh, so that's that. And then uh, who ever drank Chocola? Anybody ever drink that? I never have. A couple of you, all right. Well, that, House, the Toby Normington house. Mr. Normington was the inventor of chocolate, and uh, that was uh, 
one of one of the more recent listings. Has anybody ever seen this in Michigan City? Drive by it if you haven't. It's quite a fascinating home. Um, <clears throat> this is the Frost House. It was built as kind of a show model uh, by uh, by the Allside uh, Housing Company, and then um, Dr. Frost bought it, furniture and all, uh, just like it. And the furniture has stayed through three consecutive owners now. Everything is exactly like it was. But all sides, or uh, all sides, uh, kind of did two different models. One had a flat roof, like the Frost House, and the other had a gable roof. Um, and the owners of the Frost House have kind of created a Facebook page. So if you do like on Facebook or something, you go on there and search um, all side homes or something like that. They have been keeping a collection of all of the homes that they have found across the United States. It was a short lived kind of experiment by all side. I think it lasted about 10 years. Indiana's first drive in theater listed on the National Register, uh, Wabash uh, 1324, which had a competition to name it, just like Triway. If you know the history of Triway Drive-In, uh, there was a competition to name it. And then uh, Ernie Pyle is, anybody graduate of IU? Jack's gonna just cringe here. Do you recognize that? <laughs> I don't. All right, so out in front of the Ernie Pyle uh, School of Journalism, they have a bronze that looks just like that image. You're shaking your head. All right, good. So um, I was called to, to uh, uh, this again was a uh, so they could access grant money. Um, the Ernie Pyle World War II Museum um, has his, you know, the home that he was born in. And so that's over in Dana, Indiana, which is for many, many times. Uh, and then it's like they come in waves. In 2020, I was contacted about this and then a couple of other African American related sites. And so, um, so you're gonna see a string of these. It's kind of interesting. Uh, this was built as a, so African Americans could not join the white Knights of Columbus or Knights of uh, Pythias. So they formed their own Knights of Pythias, uh, not unlike the Masons and, and some other social organizations. And uh, this is the only building in the United States that was built as the African-American, what they call Castle Hall, which means that it was a state quarters for the uh, Black Knights of the So uh, that building is looking at trying to get uh, some, some um, tax credit funding. And Jack, who is who is it that owns that? The guy that played for basketball for IU. What was his name? <laughs> so I meet the owner, and you know he's this tall <laughs> black guy, and I'm thinking he should play for I or he should, he should probably played for you know played professional basketball. <sighs> What's his name? Alan Henderson. Alan Henderson, and uh, I leave there, and I'm talking to somebody else, and and somebody goes. Well, you know, he played for IU and then he went on to play pro ball for two or three other. <laughs> and I'm like, these are things I don't know. So, uh, but this is really fascinating. I threw this picture in here because if you've heard of Madam, uh, uh, Madam Walker, uh, CJ, so that uh, she's in this photo right here. I think that's her. Um, but she attended a big gala event there at, at that building. Kurt, where's that building located in Minneapolis? Uh, Senate. Um, North Senate, Senate, it's and awesome. the Cultural Trail passes right there. If you know where the Indianapolis, um, USS Indianapolis Memorial is, okay. it's right on that same block, okay. but on the other side of the street. Okay. Uh, like I said, when it, when it rains, it pours, I guess, but um, was contacted to do uh, the Douglas School Project. This is being uh, rehabbed into a community center. And this was a segregated school that was built in 1919, if I'm correct. And yes, that's Eleanor Roosevelt in that photo. She came to visit it. Um, I'm looking for the year. I'm looking for the year in 1940. Um, and uh, was, a, was a big proponent. 
this school, I mean, like, I'll be honest, I didn't learn much about segregation when I was in school. So I'm, I'm I know, um, I'm not teaching wokeness here, I'm just teaching history. Uh, this school was built and they gathered up all the, the black students in Kokomo and sent them here, even though some of them had to walk like a mile of street. And this is in an urban area. So, um, segregation. And speaking of segregation, I got contacted to do this little building down in Patoka, so that's Gibson County down in Southwest Indiana. And uh, this was created about 1904. This building was built uh, for a segregated school again. And they built a brand new, I mean, like just blocks away from this, they built a brand new beautiful school for the white kids in Patoka. And this is what, you know, this is what these folks got left with. And so, um, and it was never a very big school. It was only ever like about 40 students. So why they couldn't just assimilate. But anyway, um, it was actually started dual use as a church in 1930. And then that church congregation purchased it. And that's, uh, they're still part of that, or they're still in that building today. And then sometimes you turn up history that people don't want. These folks contact me. I'm not gonna leave names out because they actually have a daughter that's over here. Um, they were convinced that this building was part of the Underground Railroad. And so I started writing the nomination and I realized that, I mean, the guy's name was Erastus Farnham, right? Well, there, he wasn't the only Erastus Farnham in Steuben County. His uncle was the guy that was, um, was a conductor on the run of the Underground Railroad. And so I felt terrible. These folks, they had kids coming in, they had school trips coming in, they were showing them where the slaves were hid. And <clears throat> mugs, coffee mugs, they sent me home with one. I I felt about this big when I had to call them and say, hey, I hate to tell you this, but it's not your ancestor, it's a different ancestor. And um, that made it a little, little awkward. <laughs> beautiful home, beautiful home. I mean, what started to kind of make me kind of question is that the home didn't show up until about 1858 or 59. And I'm like, uh, yeah, it was still happening then. And then I kind of pulled out that other history where um, Erastus, uh, the uncle, um, had the home that the slaves were coming through. And uh, uh, Sojourner Truth, did stay at this house though. So when she spoke in Angola, uh, Sojourner Truth uh, actually stayed in the house. Um, one of my, this was a, uh, just a fun project. This is kind of my home away from home. Um, I'll be down there next week. Uh, so when I do my work down in Southern Indiana, how are we doing on time? I'm almost done. <laughs> when I do my work down in Southern Indiana, I'll go and I'll stay in Nashville for, for a few days because that allows me to jump over to different um, road 69 or um, 65 and so it allows me to get to different parts of the state pretty quickly so this has really become like a second home uh the the group down there peaceful valley which is kind of like white Hogan here uh hired me to to do the, the town district and it was just fascinating because you know as many times as i had been there i hadn't really absorbed as much of the history as what you know, I, I think is there that you just don't recognize because you get kind of distracted by all the good food and the little tourist shops, right? But um, really quite uh, fascinating history. This is TC Steel down in the corner. Um, how many have seen recently the, the news articles about the Indian training schools? Anybody, has anybody seen that recently? All right, well, Josiah White's uh, Manual Labor Institute or White's Residential Services that you might know it as today. Their campus started, oh, well, their, their main campus is in Wabash or south of Wabash. And sometimes I feel like people get kind of knee jerk kind of responses on things. Um, so jo Josiah's White, Josiah White's started, he funded the school in the, the 1850s. 
as an orphanage and as a place for parents who wanted something better for their children where they could send them, okay? When the school was approached by the federal government to start taking Native American children, they really struggled with that. But they decided that that was in the spirit of what Josiah White would have wanted. So, White's Residential Services, the only other, does anybody know what the other Indian training school was? Do we have any St. Joe College grads? Drexel Hall down, at, um, down in Rensselaer. That's the only other one that was in Indiana out of something like 400 schools that were established across the United States. They were in the, uh, they were in this program <laughs> for only about 12 to 15 years. And if you've read the articles, they're very sensa sensational. Um, it sounds like children were, and I'm not saying they weren't, the children were almost like abused to death. And this is not what happened to Zai Weiss. So, you know, I don't, I, you know, I get frustrated because I've had a few people reach out to me about this. And I'm like, look, not every school is the same. You can't paint things with a broad brush. Um, they, they did have, they've got a small cemetery there where there were seven students that died. Um, but, you know, given the mortality rate at the time, and the hundreds of students that went through the campus, even in that 15 year period. I, again, you can't paint things with a broad brush. There actually were Native American children that were sent there by local tribes because some of the local tribes, the Miamis weren't moved out of Indiana right away in some state. They were sending their children to whites voluntarily. So I was, and the interesting thing is, it, it formed to teach people, to teach kids a skill. And so they farmed because that was the skill that they needed when they went back to either their reservations or back to their homes. And the girls were taught how to sew and, and make clothing. So, and they still do this today. In fact, if you go on the campus, it's a very unassuming campus because most of the historic buildings, I mean, the really historic buildings are gone. But what they did is they used student labor to build. And so those boys mostly learned, you know, learned the trade of building. So when you go onto campus, you see these very simple kind of ranch style buildings. That's because they were built by the kids on the campus. In fact, they built the gym. I took a picture of the gym. The gym's actually pretty cool. Bob's been waiting for this one. <laughs> um, so this is the first First of this kind that I've ever done. Um, I think there's one other engine in Indiana, didn't we determine that? That's on the National Register in Fort Wayne. Yeah. Yeah. Like 65. Yeah. Like it is. So, uh, yeah. So, so this is housed over at the Hoosier Valley Railroad Museum. Um, and uh, when we were talking, I, I did a master plan study for, for the museum. And I said, well, get get the things listed that could be listed. And this actually came up as one of the things that the state felt was eligible. Um, good old, and Bob could probably spend an hour talking about this. Uh, the Chesapeake CNO engine, the last steam powered engine that was built, right? For the state of Missouri, that was some built after that. The, uh, one of the unique things about that is it's got a welding coil. That was fairly new technology at that time. So last five <coughs> and most of the buildings see no at that one before. So what I found remarkable about it, because I'm not a big railroad dude, but thought is um, what I found remarkable about it, and this is probably what elevated it to uh, actually be listed, one of its first jobs after it rolled off the line, at least within a year was that it was one of the trains that pulled the friendship train, which was a humanitarian relief effort that was done for Europe uh, at the end of World War II or just after World War II. And so there's pictures, I didn't pull the picture of this actual train, but this is one of the trains that came up through Texas. Um, and, you know, they all kind of merged and then, you know, it's quite a, quite a web to try and figure out. But, Really fascinating. I would encourage you to go to the Hoosier Valley Railroad Museum and see this train. 
<laughs> There's your your advertisement. So, <laughs> um, has anybody been to Decatur Homesteads over in Decatur, Indiana? Um, so this this was another kind of uh, uh, relief effort that was done, uh, you know, during the Great Depression. Um, they created what they called the homesteads, and this was the only one that was built in Indiana, uh, Decatur Homesteads, and. Um, Quite a fascinating little history. You know, the, the idea was uh, not unlike what you do with Habitat for Humanity. Let's, you know, allow these people that, you know, who could not get to a point where they could buy a house on their own, um, come, come in with a reduced mortgage and just kind of start fresh. Um, Decatur Homesteads, uh, it's interesting. It is a very desirable place to live in Decatur. Now, there was a sister project to this for farms. And <clears throat> there were two of those in Indiana. One was by one was by Vincennes and the other one was by uh, yeah. It'll come to me in a second. Also in southern Indiana, they were relocating people because of flooding. Okay. So they were bring farm it was a common commonly held farm, but you own your own home. And as you might expect, it had the feeling of kind of socialism or communism. So one started to be nicknamed Hitlerville, and the other one was nicknamed Russiaville. They very quickly disappeared. Um, the, the, the homes, some of the homes are still there. Um, they're all privately owned now, the farmland has been sold. But um, uh, <laughs> Quite interesting that Decatur actually was quite successful with their project, and the other the, the farm said we're not. No. Well, now I'm going to say it. So, as I'm doing the research, the, the point to Decatur Homesteads is that by the time all the homes were filled, and within five years, the uh, ownership and management would be transferred to a homeowners association. And at that time, you were allowed to. Um, purchase, which you've been paying for, but you were allowed to actually own title to that home. Well, the homeowners association decided they didn't want black people in Decatur homesteads. So that was written right into it. So you were only allowed to take title to the home if you guaranteed that you weren't black and you weren't going to sell it to black people. I'm not I'm not preaching wokeism. I'm just telling you this is this, this is Indiana history. And speaking of, so in Evansville, I get brought down there to um, to do a district uh, through the city um, called Baptist Town. It was kind of used as a little bit of a, a slight on the people that lived there, and they were African American freed slaves who were coming north in the 1860s, 1870s. And you see that diagonal road that kind of creates cuts through that map. You see that diagonal road? That's the old Wabash and Erie map. So that's the canal turned south at Worthington and went straight down and then came through uh, Evansville. And because the canal had no longer or had ceased to exist at that point, it started being filled in with refuse. And it was where those freed slaves could afford to actually buy land. So that started the spine of what they call Baptist town. And because there were so many Baptist churches, because they were all Baptist, um, the residents in Evansville started calling it Baptist Town. What you see that map is what they call red line. Okay. So the yellow, so the white is the white is not residential. Okay. The blue is really desirable residential property. The yellow, not so desirable. The red, that's where it costs a lot of money if you wanted to finance a purchase of property. And that Baptist Town. And that actually is what drove the, um, the boundaries for the district that I did. Speaking of Baptist churches. 
and that's actually there's a African American museum across from the school there in Baptist Town. That's who we met with. I swear I'm almost done. Chapter one. All right. So uh, so I I hit 200, and I knew this was coming. So I opened it up to Indiana Landmarks. I said, uh, nominate a property that you know you you would like to see listed as number 200. I'll do that one for free. So um, uh, this one down in Perry County, right right on the river, uh, the Tall City Carnegie Library, um, became number 200. And uh, about the time my wife started working full time is when I started doing work in vast areas across the state. And so uh, I would hire you know college kids because they were cheap um, to, to help me with these projects. And I think to date, they, you know, uh, these four guys are up there and two or three more have helped me with probably half of my nominations. So um, we got together to celebrate number 200 because we went from there to, to actually document the building um, on that trip. And so uh, that's in Nashville. It's, like I said, it's, it's a great jumping off place. Don't ask what's in the, don't ask what's in the box. <laughs> I think it was orange juice, honestly. That's a morning shot. Might have been the most. So uh, this one, uh, we're almost there. This one is um, up in Ogden Dunes, a really fascinating little building. It's a museum. I would encourage you to go there. Um, for nothing, if for nothing else, go see the uh, fireplace that's in this. So uh, the house was built by the Franks. Uh, he was a native of Southern Indiana, or well, they were both natives of Southern Indiana, uh, became a professor at Chicago University, um, wrote several books on um, uh, plant ecology, and built this little house in the dunes that they nicknamed the hourglass, sands of time, sands, dunes, sands. Um, he would bring students over and you know they would have these big outings you know walk around the dunes and, and study plant life and all that well they call this the friendship room and the friendship fireplace it is made of entirely made of fossils geodes shells it is and you can and they've got them all numbered they're just numbered real lightly and then there's a piece of paper that goes with it tells you what it is and if you see here when he did this addition, when he made it full, uh, his full-time residence, this is in shells, it says the hourglass, and this whole area is just kind of embedded with geodes. And, I mean, he had students that were sending him stuff from around the United States. They were coming in crates to, you know, so he kept incorporating it into this. I would really encourage you to, to go see it. It's, it's just a fabulous, fabulous building. Um, two that are just kind of unusual, uh, they're fairly recent. Uh, Sycamore Row, Row, which has anybody been on 29 south of Logansport, um, uh, is going to be the first property listed that is a um, kind of a uh, relates to nature conservancy in, in terms of um, advocacy. So beginning in like the 19 teens or 20s, um, people started to try to preserve that. And finally, you know, when the state was going to come through and widen the road, they, they actually bypassed it. So it was saved in the early 80s, I think it was. But um, fascinating story. People speculate that those sycamores sprouted from green corduroy logs that were laid down. This is the Michigan Road. Um, we don't believe that that's actually true, but hey, it's a great story, so we'll stick with it, right? <laughs> By the way, did anybody see the the Lake Hill? Yeah, yes. Yeah, cool. Um, what? In Lake Hill, they were doing work up there and they dug up, it's either corduroy or plank road um, on the Michigan Road through downtown Lake Hill. Um, and then and this was my first update was the Whitewater Canal uh, built. Has anybody been down in Metamora? Experience? So now there's a group that's been down through there and they have cleared the path so you can visit all of these canal structures uh, well, out of the 12 locks or something like that through that area, I think you can visit 10 of them now. So there's actually a trail that runs along. It's really quite fascinating. Built in uh, 1842, that section. And then this was a colossal undertaking. The most I had ever done, the largest district I had ever done up to this point was about 500 or so properties. This was 
This is exactly 906. Whoa. Yeah, I wasn't expecting it. It took a lot longer than what I thought. Um, but this is uh, Brookville. Uh, they were one of the communities with Kendallville, one of the two communities that got the Oprah grant. I don't know if you've seen that, the Main Street uh, program. And um, so they needed to have an update because the nomination was done in 1975 by this fellow, Mr. John Newman, uh, who I got to meet when I was there. I went into his home, who is 95 years old. So uh, I you know, had to have a picture, right? But Brookville, um, you know, up here in the northern part of Indiana, we don't think about history being this old in Indiana. Brookville was established by 1809-1810. And you see the little house? I put that in there because I kept seeing this in town. And, and I've seen it a couple of times, you know, in a few other little places in Indiana, mostly in southeast Indiana. But that is, um, and I spoke to some people back in Pennsylvania and Virginia, what that is, is that is a colonial home that the Germans brought with them, that building style and technology into, I mean, these date to like the 18 teens. So there's probably a, a dozen or so in Brookville, um, but super interesting. Has anybody been to Valley Forge? Think of, you know, General Washington's uh, headquarters at Valley Forge, and that was stone, but it looks almost exactly like that. Okay, this is the last one, and this is the one I just finished yesterday, and it was a hoot to do. So <clears throat> I get hired. Uh, this was on Indiana Landmarks uh, Top 10 Endangered Sites. Um, the Fox Lake Resort Community uh, southwest of Angola uh, became an African-American kind of uh, resort community. It was specifically built to cater to African-Americans. I get called to, to do a nomination on this house that is going to access tax credits to restore it. That's obviously an old photo. And the house was built in 1916 by a Presbyterian minister. His wife was big in the Women's Christian Temperance Union. They had big rallies at this house, Sunday school classes and lectures. It was almost like a mini Chautauqua, right? With a very hot religious fervor. Well, they sold the home in 1930 to Bell and Dempsey or Jack Dempsey Fox. Okay, no relation to the Fox Lake. In two years, they kept getting shut down for bootlegging at this house. <laughs> now talk about the irony. But don't you love the newspaper articles, the headlines? Poor Bell got, I think she got the worst end of it. Bootlegger Bell. I mean, that was that became her nickname over in uh, Angola. And then I love this. Foxy foxes are caught nip napping. I mean, like, <laughs> we're, we're, so they only had the house for two years because they all they both went to jail. Um, and then it sold, became a private residence again. And then in uh, 1947, um, Albert and Angeline uh, Pryor purchased the property. By now, the uh, the African American resort community that was established in 1924-25 had uh, really built up, and so this became a little resort home, and there were cabins that kind of surrounded it for African Americans. And has anybody seen the movie Green Book? I, I get to see it. All right. So it, it and Fox Lake, uh, along with Pryor's place, uh, were featured in, in in the Green Book, and so um, it had really fallen into to disrepair. Uh, the daughter of the Friars, um, I talked to her by phone just yesterday. Uh, she gave me kind of the, you know, the kind of oral history on it. And so that's why I said, I, I just finished it yesterday, but I was telling her, I said, let me tell you, because it was always like just kind of hearsay that it was ever used as a speakeasy or, you know, that there were, there was illegal gambling. And so I've sent her some of the articles that I found. Just real quick. She was really quite taken with it. So anyway, Great to see that being preserved. It's going to be a B and B, by the way. I won't acknowledge the clock. I don't think it's going to be. The same. <laughs> um, so this is it. So um, this is kind of the next group of nominations. Um, people ask me, well, you know, what what's kind of next on the list that you haven't done before? And out of all of those, I think I'm probably most excited about that bottom one, the Blue River Quaker. I've never done a rural district. There's only like I think three or four in Indiana. And it's basically, think of a large district like a downtown, but this is all farms. 
And so uh, the Quakers that settled uh, there in Washington County, uh, northeast of Salem, um, it, it was both uh, freed blacks that came with them from North Carolina and the North Carolina Quakers. And, and um, I'm looking, really looking forward to, there's actually a blockhouse. Does anybody know what a blockhouse is? The blockhouse from 1812. So that's where residents would gather together if they, if there was trouble. So can think of a fort, what they call a blockhouse. So there's actually a blockhouse as part of this, and that dates to 18, 1811, I think. So that's that. And so this is my grand tally. As of yesterday, uh, 6,743 major resources that have been listed on the National Register since I started this. Um, which includes 24 bridges, 61 public buildings, 24 parks or cemeteries, and 139 churches. Wow. Yes. Back of that, just last year, believe it or not, I went back to all of my nominations and I ran the numbers. And I say major resources because, especially now, they're requiring that we count all of the garages. So if you're in a residential area, you have to count the garages and all those kind of things. So, yeah. So double that right but uh thank you i'm sorry i went over uh i thought it would actually go back <laughs> should know better are there any questions i'm go just going to say if if you need to buzz out go ahead if you have questions you have a little time yeah. go ahead and stick around if you have questions but if you need to go yeah if you want to leave that way you can certainly do that. i won't call you out like i did cindy <laughs> <laughs> What are some of the uh, ones you have done uh, for free? Um, most of them in Marshall County. Okay. You mentioned a, a church in South. Uh, I did an African American church in South Bend. Uh, uh, all of that AME church in this little, it's the oldest uh, black congregation in South Bend. Your sister? Uh, yeah. I didn't know that. They some I've done it at a greatly reduced price, like the friendship training, because those guys are so nice. Um, the Wolcott House, I did that as a favor for uh, Indian landmarks. And then the, the Carnegie Library, the Tulsa City Carnegie Library, is about 10%. Yeah, most of them are, are here in Washington. Chief Menominee. That was a labor of yeah. You must have a website. I think. Yeah, it's, it's just kwgarner.com. Yeah. And that website has not been updated since it was put up in 2017. So, or 16. So. Any other questions? Yeah. All right. Well, thanks for your patience, everybody. Uh, thank you.